20 to let you know you got two minutes left. Okay, great. Uh, all right, let's, uh, let's begin. As Jim said, I'm a senior data scientist at Estrella. If you've not heard of us, uh, that's, that's okay. You will. Uh, we're um, a platform as a service, software as a service company, and we're focused around um, creating uh, like platforms for uh, organizations, people to discover uh consume and analyze uh earth observation imagery so satellite and drone imagery overhead imagery um all of those all of those terms uh to me mean pretty much the same thing uh and at the core of our uh sort of analytics platform as a service offering uh is apache spark and uh built on top of apache spark we have created a library called raster frames uh, as as uh, Jim mentioned in the last uh, jam session uh, about geospatial, so uh, I will uh, I'll um, assume that because this is the geospatial track, most of the people here are going to be familiar with a lot of the terms of art, uh, kind of buzzwords that I use. If not, uh, sh shout in the questions, and I'll try to try to clarify and connect the dots. Um, I also kind of assume that since I had you know, data science in the title of my talk that uh, a lot of folks here are maybe uh, work as a data scientist or work as like a machine learning engineer or um, are a software developer on a team that has those kinds of people as their um, users or um, as part of the as part of the you know solution that they deliver. Um, so. Uh, I'll uh, I'll I'll first uh, zoom out, and I, I gave a similar talk uh, to the I had I gave a similar talk earlier. I had some thoughts prepared, and then I saw this I saw a a, a blog post from Andrew Ng of Stanford University, who's uh, you know fairly influential in uh, the deep learning community, and he uh, he outlined that I'll bring this all back together. Promise. He outlined three important factors uh, in how advance how advancements in in AI come about. Like he kind of gave some uh, you know amusing anecdotes of things that he thought were really cool but never panned out. And and in his reflection as to why that happened, he points to these three factors: computational scaling. So that's things like uh, going from training uh, models on just the CPU to training on GPU or training on lots of GPUs working together. Um, data scaling, being able to have access to m more and more um, training data. And so as you see, again, that distinction between traditional machine learning and deep learning uh, is also marked by uh, orders of magnitude more data uh, being brought into the model training. Um, those two, I think most people are pretty comfortable with, right? Um, he also, he also outlined this idea of algorithmic improvements, um, which I don't take that statement that he made as being like, oh, we achieved a 0.2%, uh, improvement in the state of the art of this metric, uh, in this, um, machine learning task. Um, it's rather much broader. He's saying that does the, does the data does a corpus of data still have a significant amount of information that current art doesn't extract? And so it's not really asking like, are you getting two tenths of a, of a percent better? It's like, what is, uh, it, what's the information in the data? Um, what's, that kind of defines like a ceiling perhaps on, on performance. Um, and you see that, uh, you see that argument with, um, in, in certain computer vision problems where it's like, hey, we're, you know, this algorithm is now it, it is now achieving better than human performance. Like that's kind of a, that's, that's a way to kind of think about that. Um, so bringing it back into geospatial, how does this work, right? We know, uh, I, we haven't actually I've shown you any obligatory earth observation pictures, but we, we know that uh, like the satellite, uh, 
you know, commercial mosaic and you're like Google Maps or Bing Maps has a lot of information in it, right? Uh, and this is an example, this GIF is an example of, uh, you know, some <laughs> someone who's stuck at home during quarantine is mapping this uh, this village in Canada on OpenStreetMap. So OpenStreetMap is really a powerful expression of uh, how, um, you know, how openly available uh, overhead imagery data contains a great deal of information, right? Um, but I kind of want to bring the aperture a little higher than just like cartographic things. That's important work. Um, and there's a lot that's been done uh, towards that in things like SpaceNet, which is, hey, let's take these images and extract the roads, extract the buildings, extract certain relationships uh, between like physical features. Um, but there's uh, there's more, you know, kind of arguing that there's there's more uh, information that we aren't yet extracting, which is just promising. And now my now my computer is freezing up. Jim, can you give me a shout if you can hear me? I can hear you fine. Okay. Uh, yeah, you're still looks like you still got an open street map uh, slide. Yep. Great. I got the, I got the Apple Wheel of Doom as it's trying to go to the next page here. Oh dear. Uh, oh dear. <laughs> Well, uh, we're I, I, uh, we can just talk about everything and uh, paint pictures. I, I got it. We're gonna, we'll just jump right into the code demo. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, okay, I, I'll try and get, get things back on the road here. And if not, I think I have a PDF that I can, that I can riff off of probably. Sorry, team. This is the, the fun of doing this live. I'm really glad that we're doing this. All right, here we go. See, we didn't, we, that is a small, a small side, sidetrack. So looking at um, extracting imagery from this kind of like nice, uh, you know, com like commercial mosaics of overhead imagery, right? That's, that's kind of the bread and butter of how OpenStreetMap gets populated. But there's a lot more. And so I'm going to go A through Z until the end of uh, ApacheCon. Uh, start with the A's, right? So archaeology, um, this, uh, this is a screen grab from a TED Talk by uh, Sarah Parchak, who's a, an archaeology and anthropology professor. And she has this open, uh, she has this, pardon me, like crowdsourcing platform where people can go in and, and look at these uh, wonderful images that somehow she's gotten Max R to give, give her of areas that might contain uh, um, archaeological uh, sites of interest. So they found this uh, set of structures uh, that was that was up until that point not yet discovered uh, in or known to known to archaeology, right? Um, so that's that's kind of that's kind of cool, and that's an example of like a human being applied to the task in a way that was that you were finally able to like extract that information. This whatever this site is has probably been imaged by Landsat mission like many many hundreds of times, but only in, only uh, until now has been sort of surfaced uh, as as something that was that's like take known for known for what it is right. Um, Another more uh, sort of traditional science example of like information in the data from atmospheric science, uh, I credit here NASA and, and ESA. My understanding is is European Space Agency flies flies the mission, nice Sentinel Five P mission, uh, and NASA uh, did did the data processing to um, to get us to get us this very interesting map of year over year change in uh, nitrogen dioxide pollution. So Sent Sentinel Five P. Is not really a. It's not. It's not a traditional, like, camera in space. It's measuring concentrations of, of pollutants in the atmosphere, and you can see this is in in Wuhan, China, and in 2020, after, uh, around the um, Lunar New Year, there was there was uh, you know this very stark decrease as opposed to an increase in uh, in pollution. Uh, around the around the time of, of the lunar new year, so um, and that's like one example that probably was really <laughs> I respect this it was probably really hard to generate the data and create this uh, create this product right here, um, but it it goes to show and that you know that satellite is still flying. Uh, it goes to show that um, there's there's information to be extracted 
uh, from from that data uh, that's that's still being collected. So this is all like good news for AI, and there's there's more good news, right? The data scale is is large. Um, at Australia, we have some I, I can't remember the exact, but we have some like very uh, we have some very large number of like terabytes of petabytes of uh, imagery data that um, we don't actually own all of it or whatever, but we um, have have made available through our um, through our uh, catalog service, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, later in the in the code demo. Um, and that kind of points to two things, right? Like I point, like I showed you that uh, Sentinel imagery. There's there's a there's really strong open data access policies for the for um, you know U.S. and European uh, satellite missions, and that's kind of catching on around the world. Um, there's also private um, like private satellite uh, operators that you know it's not open; you have to pay. But <laughs> but there's there's uh, there's a lot of data available. Um, and and around a lot of that open data policies that says, hey, you know, this we we as a government or we as a, a a group of states intends to make this data available for a really long time uh, for the benefit of you know everyone on the planet that we're imaging, right? Um, and there's also um, been a lot of work around open standards for uh, how you publish that data, how you access that data. Um, and uh, and that's all kind of on the back of this like really long standing uh, and systematic collection of the data, um, which is which is really kind of exciting from a data scale thing. And we'll kind of borrow just in a word like the you know the cloud enables us to compute at the kind of scale that that we want to compute at, right? Um, and and so our hypothesis we finally come to it is to advance like those algorithmic improvements to really like push the envelope in in AI. Um, you know, it's like, we, we got to get this data right now that we kind of, it's, a, it's legally available, it's uh, accessible, um, it's in the cloud where the compute is, that's great. So now we just, now all we need is to like get those AI practitioners like working on it. Um, and that's where it comes to, that's where it comes to tooling, right? Um, and kind of one of the main, uh, thing that I'll focus on right, uh, Right now, and there, it's obviously more complex than this. Is is, uh, is GDAL? It's kind of like um, de facto industry standard. A lot, a lot of um, a lot of penetration into um, like a lot of other projects and a lot of other efforts. Um, and it is an abstraction layer, right? So, as a data scientist, I want to work in GDAL's like C library about as much as I want to work in TensorFlow's C library, which is not at all. Um, there are some like higher level programs. There's some library like libraries like Rasteria, which is really really good. Um, and I, I kind of make the claim that that's those that's necessary, but not sufficient for doing data science. You have to have that abstraction layer. Like I don't, I'm I don't want to have to worry if this file is a in a netcat format or a geotiff or a mrf file. That abstraction layer is necessary. I need that, but it's not enough. Um, so that's where we come to uh, to raster frames, uh, and and we kind of ask two questions um, to get to the like you know to to kind of light up that origin story. One is like, what is what is actually special about this this overhead imagery data, and what can we do to kind of overcome the things that make it special um, without doing any violence to the the value value of the data but also bring it into a general purpose tool because like in our you know in my world view anyways like data scientists ml practitioners are to some degree like generalists right like i think they get specialized as they you know dig into their thing but like they are often come from a generalist kind of background um so uh, they tend to not be geographers, right? Um, so I'll go through this quite quickly um, in terms of, of overhead image data. But um, from the perspective, again, of a data scientist, it's like an image is a multi-dimensional array. It's a 3D tensor um, that has height and width and a, a number of channels. It's usually one, three, or four channels. And it's usually like about a megapixel. It's like maybe a thousand by a thousand pixels is kind of like a typical image that you'll come across in computer vision and deep, 
deep learning um, on images. So what's different about overhead imagery is that the, the, the images that you get in these files uh, tend to be more on the order of like 100 megapixels. They tend to have more on the order of, um, you know, five or 12 bands. They have these really interesting different kinds of encodings um, that are um, that are not not just the typical like okay I'm going to read this PNG file <laughs> and go on and go along my day um, and and there's a lot less kind of standard like you you get any kind of normal normal any kind of vanilla image file and it's red green blue um, but that band ordering is completely arbitrary it could be anything um, in Earth observation imagery. Um, and there's there's some additional things on top of it, right? So there's more data uh, that we want to keep track of, right? Location data is um, is key that allows us to um, gain a lot of context, right? And so that's information that lets us reference information, which I think is key. Like when you think about Andrew Ng's um, like algorithmic improvement, is there information in the data that hasn't hasn't yet been fully explored? location in that context and like time uh, is I think partic particularly important um, in in looking at this data um, and uh, there's there's a lot of other metadata that give you additional context like you know uh, the mission that it was taken by when it was taken this sun sensor geometry what processing has it gone through and so on and so on and then there's this totally crazy idea of no data that doesn't exist in like any like computer vision kind of typical application that a data scientist would see because you never get like a an image net image where like a third of it is just gone it's just like sorry the camera malfunctioned but we you know we we kept on going with this example um because it's it's so rare in the um sort of natural perspective photography uh, imaging space, um, but it's like quite common in uh, in overhead data. So, anyways, we finally like wrap our head around like those uh, those differences uh, and come to raster frames. So, uh, here is on the left physical model of what a large coverage might look like. You have your four bands stacked up and there could be, you know, some arbitrary number of bands stacked up. You have this large coverage that's like, you know, many thousands of pixels. Um, and and, and uh, our, you know, raster frames data frame model is on the right. Um, so that's, that's uh, here's, here's how that works. We're gonna take that really large coverage and divide it up into pretty small um, areas called tiles. Each tile is maybe 128 or 256 pixels square. Uh, each tile is also only one channel. Then we're gonna take each channel uh, and put them in a separate column of the data frame. So you can see that like on the far right, there are four, there are four channels divided up and then uh, like we've kind of broken this, broken this uh, really large coverage down, down along the rows. And then we're kind of associating all of that metadata um, that we have for each, uh, for each row. So while we're showing like the physical model here of like one really large image, what we, what we can kind of imply with this is lots and lots of, um, of images that all go into the same data frame. Um, and this is supposed, this is a like wall of words, so it's supposed to have animation in it. Um, but there's a couple of uh, important things that we do. I will go through this fairly quickly, um, even though it represents a lot of hours of people's lives. Um, first, we have a, a strong Python API, like kind of try to know who our audience is. Um, so it's, uh, it's pretty easy to, to pip install um, if you, do need to work with GDAL, there's a little more futzing to do, uh, but we'll we'll try to help you with it. Um, we have a custom data source for us, um, Spark data frames, uh, accessible through the Spark session, through spark.read.raster. I'll show that in our little um, demo. Um, we define a tile user-defined type. Um, so that gives us a single 
uh, like column type that we can use to carry the tensor, as well as like some of the most important pieces of metadata about the location. Um, and when you bring a tile uh, into the Python driver, it's just it's a thin wrapper around a NumPy int array, which feels really good um, as like a Python consumer of this of this uh, API. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of column functions uh, that work like on the JVM distributed in Spark to operate on either the location part or the tensor part of that tile UDT um, or other kind of related uh, objects that like we have geometry objects. Um, and all of our location and geometry stuff is thanks to um, GeoMesa, another location tech project. And all of our uh, tensor stuff is thanks to um, GeoTrellis, which is also a location tech project. Right, Jim? Anyways, um, and then we have a, a variety of Spark ML transformers to help us uh, do that integration between um, Spark SQL and Spark machine learning, Spark ML for machine learning, um, so that you can work with the, this tile UDT and pipelines. Uh, and then we also have an IPython module that uh, gives some nice functionality for visualization and inspection of, of, the, of the tile UDT. Uh, and so then I think, yeah, here we go into our into our demo. Um, apologies, the name of the repos. Uh, it the, it uh, this uh, was also presented this code demo at um, at Spark AA Summit. But uh, here we go. Um, so we are going to take a look at uh, a set of of Kaggle data about wildfires in California, which I understand is still relevant even many months after Spark AI Summit. Um, and uh, some land surface temperature data from MODIS satellite missions. So like uh, MODIS is a really kind of awesome satellite mission, but it's not famous for outside of like Earth observation people because it doesn't produce like really detailed, uh, you know, pictures that people like to look at. Um, but it's a, it's a very important kind of scientific mission. Um, so we'll go through, and uh, I'll, I'll skip past this. All of this is on the all of this is on the GitHub repo if you want to study this. So we're going to read up, read our um, Kaggle data set, and do some basic data cleaning. We do a little bit of kind of cheating. They give us a point location for the fire, and an area, like an acres burned to the fire. So we're going to kind of buffer that point and say, well, maybe about like this, like maybe around in this area is is where that fire happened. Um, at, I'll leave it as an exercise for the reader to uh, figure out like where, like how we can do an analytic to identify the area that actually got burned in the fire, which is totally possible uh, with satellite data. Um, and then so that you guys don't have to wait uh, forever, we're going to filter this down to one year of, of data. Uh, so then we get into um, some of the proprietary goodies. We're in, uh, we're in Estrella's Earth AI notebook environment here. Um, I'm going to use a few of the, just play around with a few of the proprietary toys in here, um, not to bore you too much. Uh, but this builds, it's, it's kind of fun because this builds on top of uh, an open standard called Stack Spatio Temporal Asset Catalogs. It's a way to describe uh, the location of, or the, like describe access to um, satellite data, drone data, and this type of thing. So first, I'm going to look in our catalog for different for a collect any collection that contains the word temp. What do I have about temp? Uh, here's my modus uh, mod 11a1 collection about land surface temperature and emissivity. Um, great, that's what I wanted. Um, and this is uh, this is the bands that are available. That um, basically you can see their um, tiffs. Um, the different uh, bands of data that are, there's a lot. Most of them are, most of them? Many of them are metadata. Uh, the one that we're gonna work with is, is the daytime land surface temperature. Uh, and so this is like aggregate over a one kilometer by one kilometer pixel. So it's not, you know, Jason, you've got about 10 minutes left. Okay, great. We're gonna make it guys. Uh, so then I, then I uh, go through and query that catalog once for each individual fire. I'm looking for any image from this MODIS uh, 11A1 that is in between the time the fire started and the fire was extinguished that intersects that kind of bubble that I defined um, around the fire. Uh, and then I'm gonna finally join that all, all back up and make this, uh, 
make this data frame. Here's kind of what we're looking at. We have this unique ID, which is from the Kaggle Fire data set. We have a date time that's referring to the date of the modus image. And then I have this link to the, it's not real, uh, this S3 bucket uh, and um, key that tells me where's this, where's this raster data item um, at. So for each fire, I have, uh, and you can see this unique ID is repeated. For each fire, I have pot potentially many different uh, um, images uh, um, of, of land surface temperature. So finally, I'm gonna, I'm gonna merge all that stuff together and then use my Spark data frame reader. I'm gonna pass in the data frame and a list of column names. And the list of column names tells me, tells the reader, okay, these are the columns that contain a URI that references data that you are to read. Um, so here's my schema. I get my I get my path, my original path back, and and this struct which has the tile UDT in it along with the location. And you can see it's pretty simple. Uh, this uh, we have the proj string and um, a struct of, of four doubles telling me where in where in that CRS is is this tile. And then all of the rest of our there's two two main categories here. The rest of this data is from the Kaggle data set, this kind of camel case stuff. So there's administrative info, there's resources used, and there's like damage caused, like fatalities, uh, structures damaged, um, and so on. And then the and then the kind of bottom half of this is all of, is all of the metadata about the satellite image that is is paired with that. So the next thing that I'll do is some nice handy Ge GeoMesa. Uh, filtering. So I only want uh, I only want to keep rows where um, that my fire bubble like intersects with that geometry of of the of the data. Um, and so because I didn't want to punish you guys waiting for this, uh, this should be pretty fast. We have it cached. Um, so I have 625 entries in my in my data frame. Uh, and then this is kind of our this is from this point below. I think I, somewhere in here I have a shortcut. Uh, where you can read a G yeah from this shortcut below everything is all it's all open source uh, and there's there's no proprietary secret sauce in here um, so this is this is all IPython uh, module within PyRaster frames uh, that enables this kind of table display which is um, I, I think pretty useful so you can see the name of the fire a sample of an image location about the image the date of that image. You can kind of see its relationship to the um, to the time interval that the fire happened in. Um, the tile um, is so there's there it is as a Spark SQL row, um, and you can you can dig around in there and see okay it's it's uh, it's just a thin wrapper over a, a NumPy array um, with some nice uh, nice functionality to help us get a a nice a nice wrapper in in IPython. Um, like I said, we had we have something over a hundred uh, different kind of column functions and aggregates defined in raster frames. Uh, this is this is one where we we go back to the documentation. It says, okay, to get from this digital number to Kelvin uh, that was measured, divide by fifty. So we do that, uh, and then we're gonna then we're gonna aggregate. I'll I'll bring your attention to this uh, bit here, raster frame RF ag stats. So we're gonna get. Um, we're going to run a st an aggregate statistic over all of the cells in the tiles and all of the rows in the column um, for the whole data frame, grouped by uh, grouped by basically distinct fire. Right, all of this is that Kaggle like per fire info. Um, so we're going to take that series of however many it was, five or twenty images uh, per fire and aggregate that all together and uh, we're gonna we're gonna pull out of that stats structure the max and some of the other things and then uh, and then take a peek and that will be kind of the end of our demo but just kind of to show you um, this uh, the intuition here is we had this we had this Kaggle data set which has a lot of interesting things about the fire and then we have this other free data set that gives us physical measurements of what was happening to the surface of the earth while that fire was happening. We've now been, and we're now able to bring that together. So like at the end of the day, we didn't, we didn't make a map of anything. 
but we did enrich this existing data set with um, with this with this Earth, Earth observation data. So that's just kind of like hints at a direction that um, that this uh, that this work can go. Um, and there's uh, I, I'm a, the talk before me was hopefully going to talk a lot about like how you can apply deep learning to uh, this to Earth observation data and kind of give you a sense of like how a lot of that work is about extracting semantic meaning from these images, um, which which was going to be a, an awesome dovetail to this. But use your use your imagination, uh, and and if you look at things like SpaceNet, you can you can see how that's really um, how that's really true. And there's a lot of there's a lot more work to be done to extract even more information out of out of the, the body of data that we have. So a quick recap of raster frames, and then I'll do questions with whatever time we have left. Uh, it's on it's under location tech. It's uh, Apache two licensed. Uh, with like a, a, a strong commercial friendly IP governance model. Um, check out the website to get started. You can pip and install raster frames if you'd like. You can try our try our notebook product. Uh, I think it's free for a week. I think I can probably give you a, a coupon code if you if you at me on something um, and get you some extra time. And then feel free to contribute. Uh, our Gitter channel is kind of the main place to come with like, hey, I'm new and I have a question. Um, we also have uh, issue tracking and pull requests on GitHub. And if you want to contribute, you can check out our uh, contributors guide. Uh, and that's it. I'll go ahead and take your questions. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so yeah, if folks, wow. if, folks have, yeah cool. if folks have any questions, uh, feel free to add them in chat. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything in particular that I'm curious about, because uh, I've had a chance to see um, raster frame several times uh, as, as it's been uh, in development. Uh, I definitely liked what you said earlier about the uh, that uh, an abstraction layer like GDAL is necessary, but it doesn't um, automatically just enable uh, data science. You know, you need something else, and so yeah. And and Spark gives us. I, I kind of just took it as an assumed like everybody here knows uh, all about Spark, all about Spark, but Spark gives us that. Um, the ability to take those like kind of data reads, right? And which is we're mostly doing reads uh, in this in this kind of analysis that we're talking about, and um, do that in a way that's distributed and and, and abstracts away a lot of the um, sort of grunt work of thinking about exactly how do I set up all my maps and reduces and all of my things. Um, yeah, uh, cloud optimize. Uh, 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 I'm gonna. So uh, apologies about your name. I see in the chat there might be a silly question, something about code geotiff, but like cog optimized geotiffs, uh, I assume is what you mean. Yeah, that's absolutely uh, part of the part of the sauce that makes this all work. Um, we are heavily opinionated towards uh, cloud optimized geotiffs because it does all the things in the way that we want to do them in raster frames so to to read out like if you saw that um, physical model versus the data model we're going to go we're going to go drost effect again here um in this in this uh like sort of physical model to data model like on the left that physical model really is how the data is is stored as well as like how you see it in a map but um so we need these like kind of arbitrary range reads of, of small ranges um, to make this work. So to be able to go to uh, a bucket in a cloud or an object in a cloud store and say, give me this range, like give me the header and then, okay, now I know what I need. Give me this range of, of bytes out of it. And that's my row data. Um, that's, that's super powerful. Um, it, it's absolutely, uh, it's absolutely a, a huge part of what makes this practical. Um, chunking in net, uh, HDF, net CDF, and czar. Yeah, I, that. So those I'm familiar with uh, HDF, net CDF, and the, the kind of family of things, um, but I'm I'm not as familiar with uh, like how that would really play in. Um, yeah, and like that sort of parallel distributed uh, compute to like manage the tasks and all of that stuff. I, I, I really don't know. I can't really speak to that. Uh, but yeah, it'd be, that's, a, that's a cool question. And we have, 
we have uh, theoretically through GDAL, we have the ability to read HDF and net CDF files, uh, but I'm not aware of it being done and there may, be, there may need to be a little more work to um, get everything like tied together just right. Yeah, it, and I think that's um, maybe maybe as a closing thing, It's this is where we're starting to see where it's good to have the abstraction layer, things like uh, cloud optimized geotiffs help us make sure that even though we're reaching through an abstraction layer, we're doing that in a way that optimizes our reads. And so to George's point, yeah. uh, being able to do that across multiple uh, different file formats would be really interesting. The next presentation in our track is going to be starting uh, here in about three or four minutes, so we should jump over to that. Uh, there is going to be a birds of a feather that'll start after uh, that talk at, I believe, 4.15 uh, Eastern. So if you've got more time this afternoon, uh, uh, either for you, Jason, or for anyone else, uh, you can come hang out with us there. And uh, you can ask George more questions about uh, HDF and that CDF. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Jim. And I posted our um, our project's Gitter link in the in the chat. It's easy. It's easy to find. Um, and you can if you have a question, you can get on there and, and ask. Um, and yeah, we're happy to happy to help you out get get on your journey doing all this.